Joe, over the last several decades, uh, cosmology has gone from science fiction to metaphysics and, and now to a precision science and in which you've had a remarkable contribution. Um, as you look to the future, to the next decade, two decades, uh, what's the future like? So I think the future of cosmology is really beginning to get very exciting. Um, when I began in cosmology, um, maybe um, 30, 40 years ago, uh, we were uncertain about the fundamental properties of the universe, such as its age, or its average density, to within a fact of a few, you know, two, three. Mm -hmm. And now, since advancements in the past, I would say decade, we've got precision to a percent, okay, or even somewhat better. Uh, we know the age, you know, it's precisely 13.6 billion years, and so forth. And so the question is now, uh, what's curious about all this is that cosmology, the theory hasn't changed that much. And we know that we need better precision to answer really fundamental questions, such as um, how did it all begin? You know, we have a theory, inflation theory, but it has as many questions as answers at this yeah. point. Um, and so a lot of my colleagues feel that the cosmic microwave background is um, the future of cosmology. And we've had a tremendous you know, revolution with experiments like the Planck satellite most recently and, and many others. And they have got us to the point where we have this um, incredible picture of the past. Um, the first back to the wind universe was maybe um, a few hundred thousand years old. Um, but we need to get back even further. And um, so there are experiments afoot now to measure the, what will be the ultimate microwave background experiment, which is the, a prediction of the inflation theory, um, which gives the, the background a slight polarization, a slight twist that's unique to inflation, um, we think. The trouble is it's a very weak effect, um, this polarization signal, and you have to do maybe a hundred times better in terms of signal than we do now in terms of sensitivity to get there. And the worry, of course, is there are so many foregrounds that contaminate that signal. There's a whole issue of galactic dust, which also gives you a similar signal that you have to disentangle. Um, there's the effect of dark matter, which bends the light slightly, and that also messes things up. You have to fight against all of this. And, um, and so it turns out that to get this factor of 100 in precision, um, I believe that we'll never get much more out of the microwave background. The reason is very simple. Um, if you ask how many independent bits of information you have on the sky um, from the microwave background, it's roughly one million. One million modes, as we oh, say. Oh. Okay? And you can never do better, therefore, than 0.1%, the root of a million in precision. Oh. You're stuck there completely. Oh. So we can never get this extra factor of 100 from the microwave background. So, that's launched a whole new program in cosmology um, based on galaxy surveys. This will be done with the Euclid satellite, with other experiments. The original was the Sloan. Uh, the original was a Sloan with a million galaxy yeah. redshifts. So the ultimate will be... So a redshift of a million galaxies shows you their position in time and, and, uh, and, 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 and how far that's away from That's right. Us. And therefore you can probe their positions and look for cosmological information, right, such right, as right. any you know, slight fluctuations in space which tell you how the clustering of the universe began, how galaxies formed. Right. And so the Sloan with a million galaxies is no more powerful, less powerful actually, in microwave background with uh, its million modes. Uh, 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 uh. But the new survey, um, under construction now, with something called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, LSST for short, built in Chile, a huge eight meter telescope, surveys the sky rapidly, uh, many times a night actually. It's planned to get the redshifts, the distances, if you like, of 10 billion galaxies. Oh. Which is mind blowing. Oh, that's 10 billion, okay. And, and getting them sequentially in time, right? Uh, well, you know, sequentially around the sky, it'll be a snapshot of the universe, of course. Right, but there'll be but many of them. So. Ten, absolutely, many snapshots, but it'll add up to give you maybe 10 billion different galaxies. And so that's hugely powerful, um, and we can try to use that also to do cosmology with, and that also will tell us about the structure on the larger scales, on all scales of the universe. But there is a problem there. Um, and this, galaxies are very complex systems. They, they've suffered all sorts of um, okay. weird deformations as they were made. They've merged together and so forth. 
And so if you're a little conservative about this, you say, well, with 100 billion galaxies, how many really independent points do I ten, have? 10 billion, yeah. Uh, with, with ten, my 10 billion, that's right. How many independent points do I have? And that probably is only, you know, I must need 100 points to get one good data point, you know, that's robust. So at the, in the best of circumstances, one can imagine 100 million independent bits uh, of information on the sky. Uh which is already a hundred times better than the microwave background. Yeah. And Sloan. And a thousand times better than Sloan, yeah. actually. So it's a huge advance. But the problem is that with hundred augmentation microwave background, you just win a factor of 10 in precision, which goes to square root. And so that factor of 10 is not enough to get you the factor of 100 oh. that you really need to do a fundamental test of the inflation theory. So all inflation theories predict something weird should happen at that extra 100% increase in precision. Something should be there. Um, so where do we go next? So here is, I think, the only place to go, and that is um, we have to think of a clever way of getting more information out of the sky. Okay, And so a galaxy, such as the Milky Way, was assembled out of millions of clouds of gas. And if you had a clever way to look at those millions of clouds of gas before the galaxy formed, oh that would give you them all the information you need. And there is a way to do that. You have to go back in time to what we call the Dark Ages, before any galaxies were formed, when there were only the hydrogen clouds, and then there were many, many billions of them. How do you see them? Well, they're incredibly cold, and you can see them in absorption against the microwave background. It's tiny dips in the signal against the microwave background. The only trouble is you're using um, a property of hydrogen to look for these things called tw the 21 centimeter emission, which comes from the flip in the level of a hydrogen atom, the electrons yeah. flip from one to another, and give you this very low frequency piece of radiation, actually 1500 um, megahertz. However, to go to the dark ages, the radiation gets stretched from there to now. Yeah. So we have a redshift of maybe 50 to study this stuff which means 50. that it's That's not <laughs> 21 centimeters anymore, but now it's 10 meters, okay? Yeah. Or 30 megahertz, incredibly low frequency. And that's really tough to do from the ground. Um, people are trying um, with experiments like the Square Kilometer Array in, um, in Australia, it's counterpart in South Africa, to be built in the next decade, but they will not get the sensitivity they need to really pin this down. So what do you need? So you have to go to the best place in the, around us, um, the most radio quiet place where there's no noise from your cell phones, from your internet, from the ionosphere, um, which is a terrible thing for this sort of experiment. And that is the only place is the far side of the moon because uh -huh. there you're shielded from the earth. And so the dream is to have, to build such a telescope on the far side of the moon. Now, this isn't such a challenging engineering project as it seems because this telescope consists of an array of many, many dipoles actually, each of which is just 10 meters across. And so the sort of plan that people have you know, dreamt of is to imagine first going to the moon, build a lunar base, um, and then think of science to do and go to the far side of the moon with lunar rovers. You can lay out carpets of metallic dipoles imprinted in mylar plastic. It's one scheme that comes from the JPL laboratory. And eventually you would have to have millions of these things laid out on the backside of the moon, all connected by some very fancy uh, laser system to give right. you the connections and the correlations you need to make the signal. And then have a very, very sophisticated way to beam all this back to Earth, maybe with satellites around the moon, small satellites. So that's the sort of dream one needs. And um, we think that maybe this is a project that will take 20 years, if you want the time scale, because that's the time scale over which um, certainly both the European and Chinese space agencies are planning projects on the moon at this point.